Louis Stevenson. Chapter 10. Part 2. At the consulate we learned that Captain Trent had alighted, such is, I believe, the classic phrase, at the What Cheer House. To that large and unaristocratic hostelry we drove, and addressed ourselves to a large clerk, who was chewing a toothpick and looking straight before him. Captain Jacob Trent? Gone, said the clerk. Where has he gone? asked Pinkerton. Can't say, said the clerk. When did he go? I asked. Don't know, said the clerk, and with the simplicity of a monarch offered us the spectacle of his broad back. What might have happened next I dread to picture, for Pinkerton's excitement had been growing steadily, and now burned dangerously high. But we were spared extremities by the intervention of a second clerk. Why, Mr. Dodd, he exclaimed, running forward to the counter, glad to see you, sir. Can I do anything in your way? How virtuous actions blossom! Here was a young man to whose pleased ears I had rehearsed just before the battle, mother, at some weekly picnic, and now, in that tense moment of my life, he came from the machine to be my helper. Captain Trent of the wreck? Oh, yes, Mr. Dodd. He left about twelve, he and another of the men. The Kanaka went earlier by the city of Peking. I know that. I remember expressing his chest. Captain Trent? I'll inquire, Mr. Dodd. Yes, they were all here. Here are the names on the register. Perhaps you would care to look at them while I go and see about the baggage? I drew the book toward me and stood looking at the four names all written in the same hand, rather a big and rather a bad one, Trent, Brown, Hardy, and, instead of Ah Sing, Joseph Amalu. Pinkerton, said I, suddenly, have you that Occidental in your pocket? Never left me, said Pinkerton, producing the paper. I turned to the account of the wreck. Here, said I, here's the name. Elias Goddedal, mate. Why do we never come across Elias Goddedal? That's so, said Jim. Was he with the rest in that saloon when you saw them? I don't believe it, said I. They were only four, and there was none that behaved like a mate. At this moment the clerk returned with his report. The captain, it appeared, came with some kind of an express wagon, and he and the man took off three chests and a big satchel. Our porter helped to put them on, but they drove the cart themselves. The porter thinks they went downtown. It was about one. Still in time for the city of Peking, observed Jim. How many of them were here? I inquired. Three, sir, and the Kanaka, replied the clerk. I can't somehow find out about the third, but he's gone too. Mr. Goddedal, the mate, wasn't here then, I asked. No, Mr. Dodd, none but what you see, says the clerk. Nor you never heard where he was? No, any particular reason for finding these men, Mr. Dodd, inquired the clerk. This gentleman and I have bought the wreck, I explained. We wish to get some information, and it is very annoying to find the men all gone. A certain group had gradually formed about us, for the wreck was still a matter of interest and at this one of the bystanders, a rough seafaring man, spoke suddenly. I guess the mate won't be gone, said he. He's main sick. Never left the sick bay aboard the Tempest, so they tell me. Jim took me by the sleeve. Back to the consulate, said he. But even at the consulate nothing was known of Mr. Goddedal. The doctor of the Tempest had certified him very sick. He had sent his papers in but never appeared in person before the authorities. "'Have you a telephone laid on to the Tempest?' asked Pinkerton. "'Laid on yesterday,' said the clerk. "'Do you mind asking or letting me ask? "'We are very anxious to get hold of Mr. Goddedal.' "'All right,' said the clerk, and turned to the telephone. "'I'm sorry,' he said presently. "'Mr. Goddedal has left the ship, and no one knows where he is.' Do you pay the men's passage home? I inquired, a sudden thought striking me. If they want it, said the clerk, sometimes they don't. But we paid the Kanaka's passage to Honolulu this morning, and by what Captain Trent was saying, 
I understand the rest are going home together. Then you haven't paid them, said I? Not yet, said the clerk. And you would be a good deal surprised if I were to tell you they were gone already, I asked. Oh, I should think you were mistaken, said he. Such is the fact, however, said I. I am sure you must be mistaken, he repeated. May I use your telephone one moment, asked Pinkerton, and as soon as permission had been granted, I heard him ring up the printing office where our advertisements were usually handled. More I did not hear, for suddenly recalling the big bad hand in the register of the Whatcher House, I asked the consulate clerk if he had a specimen of Captain Trent's writing, whereupon I learned that the captain could not write, having cut his hand open a little before the loss of the brig, that the latter part of the log even had been written up by Mr. Godedal, and that Trent had always signed with his left hand. By the time I had gleaned this information, Pinkerton was ready. "'That's all we can do. Now for the schooner,' said he, "'and by tomorrow evening I lay hands on Godadal, or my name's not Pinkerton.' "'How have you managed?' I inquired. "'You'll see before you get to bed,' said Pinkerton. "'And now, after all this backwarding and forwarding, "'and that hotel clerk and that bug Belair's, It'll be a change and a kind of consolation to see the schooner. I guess things are humming there. But on the wharf, when we reached it, there was no sign of bustle, and but for the galley smoke, no mark of life on the Nora Crena. Pinkerton's face grew pale, and his mouth straightened as he leapt on board. Where's the captain of this? And he left the phrase unfinished, finding no epithet sufficiently energetic for his thoughts. It did not appear whom or what he was addressing, but a head, presumably the cook's, appeared in answer at the galley door. In the cabin at dinners, said the cook deliberately, chewing as he spoke. Is that cargo out? No, sir. None of it? Oh, there's some of it out. We'll get at the rest of it livelier tomorrow, I guess. I guess there'll be something broken first, said Pinkerton, and strode to the cabin. Here we found a man, fat, dark, and quiet, seated gravely at what seemed a liberal meal. He looked up upon our entrance, and seeing Pinkerton continue to stand facing him in silence, hat on head, arms folded, and lips compressed, an expression of mingled wonder and annoyance began to dawn upon his placid face. Well, said Jim, and so this is what you call rushing around? Who are you? cries the captain. Me? I'm Pinkerton, retorted Jim, as though the name had been a talisman. You're not very civil, whoever you are, was the reply. But still a certain effect had been produced, for he scrambled to his feet and added hastily, A man must have a bit of dinner, you know, Mr. Pinkerton. Where's your mate? snapped Jim. He's uptown, returned the other. Uptown, sneered Pinkerton. Now I'll tell you what you are. You're a fraud, and if I wasn't afraid of dirtying my boot, I would kick you and your dinner into that dock. I'll tell you something, too, retorted the captain, duskily flushing. I wouldn't sail this ship for the man you are, if you went upon your knees. I've dealt with gentlemen up to now. I can tell you the names of a number of gentlemen you'll never deal with any more, and that's the whole of Longhurst gang, said Jim. I'll put your pipe out in that quarter, my friend. Here, rout out your traps as quick as look at it, and take your vermin along with you. I'll have a captain in this very night that's a sailor, and some sailors to work for him. I'll go when I please, and that's tomorrow morning, cried the captain after us, as we departed for the shore. There's something gone wrong with the world today. It must have come bottom up, wailed Pinkerton. Bale airs, and then the hotel clerk, and now this fraud. And what am I to do for a captain, Loudon, with Longhurst gone home an hour ago, and the boys all scattered? I know, said I. Jump in, and then to the driver. Do you know Black Tom's? Thither then we rattled, passed through the bar, and found, as I had hoped, Johnson in the enjoyment of club life. 
The table had been thrust upon one side, a South Sea merchant was discoursing music from a mouth organ in one corner, and in the middle of the floor Johnson and a fellow seaman, their arms clasped about each other's bodies, somewhat heavily danced. The room was both cold and close. A jet of gas, which continually menaced the heads of the performers, shed a coarse illumination. The mouth organ sounded shrill and dismal, and the faces of all concerned were church-like in their gravity. It were, of course, indelicate to interrupt these solemn frolics, so we edged ourselves to chairs, for all the world like belated comers in a concert room, and patiently waited for the end. At length the organist, having exhausted his supply of breath, ceased abruptly in the middle of a bar. With the cessation of the strain, the dancers likewise came to a full stop, swayed a moment, still embracing, and then separated and looked about the circle for applause. "'Very well danced,' said one. But it appears the compliment was not strong enough for the performers, who, forgetful of the proverb, took up the tale in person. "'Well,' said Johnson, "'I mayn't be no sailor, but I can dance.' And his late partner, with an almost pathetic conviction, added, "'My foot is as light as a feather.' Seeing how the wind set, you may be sure I added a few words of praise before I carried Johnson alone into the passage, to whom, thus mollified, I told so much as I judged needful of our situation, and begged him, if he would not take the job himself, to find me a smart man. Me, he cried, I couldn't no more do it than I could try to go to hell. I thought you were a mate, said I. "'So I am a mate,' giggled Johnson, "'and you don't catch me shipping no ways else. "'But I'll tell you what, I believe I can get you Artie Nares. "'You seen Artie, first-rate navigator and a son of a gun for style.' "'And he proceeded to explain to me that Mr. Nares, "'who had the promise of a fine bark in six months, "'after things had quieted down, "'was in the meantime living very private "'and would be pleased to have a change of air.' I called out Pinkerton and told him. Nares, he cried, as soon as I had come to the name, I would jump at the chance of a man that had had Nares trousers on. Why, Loudon, he's the smartest deep-water mate out of San Francisco, and draws his dividends regular in service and out. This hearty indorsation clinched the proposal. Johnson agreed to produce Nares before six the following morning, and Black Tom, being called into the consultation, promised us four smart hands for the same hour, and even, what appeared to all of us excessive, promised them sober. The streets were fully lighted when we left Black Tom's. Street after street sparkling with gas or electricity, line after line of distant luminaries climbing the steep sides of hills towards the over-vaulting darkness, and, on the other hand, where the waters of the bay invisibly trembled, a hundred riding lanterns marked the position of a hundred ships. The sea fog flew high in heaven, and at the level of man's life and business it was clear and chill. By silent consent we paid the hack off and proceeded arm in arm towards the poodle dog for dinner. At one of the first hoardings I was aware of a bill sticker at work. It was a late hour for this employment and I checked Pinkerton until the sheet should be unfolded. This is what I read. Two hundred dollars reward. Officers and men of the wrecked brig Flying Scud, applying, personally or by letter, at the office of James Pinkerton, Montana Block, before noon tomorrow, Tuesday the 12th, will receive two hundred dollars reward. This is your idea, Pinkerton, I cried. "'Yes, they've lost no time. I'll say that for them. Not like the fraud,' said he. "'But mind you, Loudon, that's not half of it. The cream of the idea is here. We know our men's sick. Well, a copy of that has been mailed to every hospital, every doctor, and every drug store in San Francisco. Of course, from the nature of our business, Pinkerton could do a thing of the kind at a figure extremely reduced.' For all that, I was appalled at the extravagance, and said so. "'What matter a few dollars now?' he replied sadly. 
It's in three months that the pool comes, Loudon. We walked on again in silence, not without a shiver. Even at the Poodle Dog we took our food with small appetite and less speech, and it was not until he was warmed with a third glass of champagne that Pinkerton cleared his throat and looked upon me with a deprecating eye. Loudon, said he, there was a subject you didn't wish to be referred to. I only want to do so indirectly. It wasn't, he faltered. It wasn't because you were dissatisfied with me, he concluded with a quaver. Pinkerton, cried I. No, no, not a word just now, he hastened to proceed. Let me speak first. I appreciate, though I can't imitate, the delicacy of your nature, and I can well understand you would rather die than speak of it, and yet might feel disappointed. I did think I could have done better myself, but when I found out how tight money was in this city, and a man like Douglas B. Longhurst, a forty-niner, the man that stood at bay in a corn patch for five hours against the San Diablo squatters, weakening on the operation, I tell you, Loudon, I began to despair. And I may have made mistakes. No doubt there are thousands who could have done better. But I give you a loyal hand on it. I did my best. My poor Jim, said I, as if I ever doubted you. As if I didn't know you had done wonders. All day I've been admiring your energy and resource. And as for that affair... "'No, Loudon, no more, not a word more. "'I don't want to hear,' cried Jim. "'Well, to tell you the truth, I don't want to tell you,' said I, "'for it's a thing I'm ashamed of.' "'Ashamed, Loudon? "'Oh, don't say that. "'Don't use such an expression even in jest,' protested Pinkerton. "'Do you never do anything you're ashamed of?' I inquired. "'No,' says he, rolling his eyes. "'Why?' I'm sometimes sorry afterwards, when it pans out different from what I figured, but I can't see what I would want to be ashamed for. I sat there a while considering with admiration the simplicity of my friend's character. Then I sighed. Do you know, Jim, what I'm sorriest for, said I? At this rate, I can't be best man at your marriage. My marriage, he repeated, echoing the sigh. No marriage for me now. I'm going right down tonight to break it to her. I think that's what's shaken me all day. I feel as if I had had no right, after I was engaged, to operate so widely. Well, you know, Jim, it was my doing, and you must lay the blame on me, said I. Not a cent of it, he cried. I was as eager as yourself, only not so bright at the beginning. No, I've myself to thank for it but it's a wrench. While Jim departed on his dolorous mission, I returned alone to the office, lit the gas, and sat down to reflect on the events of that momentous day, on the strange features of the tale that had been so far unfolded, the disappearances, the terrors, the great sums of money, and on the dangerous and ungrateful task that awaited me in the immediate future. It is difficult, in the retrospect of such affairs, to avoid attributing to ourselves in the past a measure of the knowledge we possess today. But I may say, and yet be well within the mark, that I was consumed that night with a fever of suspicion and curiosity, exhausted my fancy in solutions, which I still dismissed as incommensurable with the facts, and in the mystery by which I saw myself surrounded, found a precious stimulus for my courage, and a convenient soothing draught for conscience. Even had all been plain sailing, I do not hint that I should have drawn back. Smuggling is one of the meanest of crimes, for by that we rob a whole country pro rata, and are therefore certain to impoverish the poor. To smuggle opium is an offense particularly dark, since it stands related not so much to murder, as to massacre. Upon all these points I was quite clear. My sympathy was all in arms against my interest, and had not Jim been involved, I would have dwelt almost with satisfaction on the idea of my failure. But Jim, his whole fortune, and his marriage, depended upon my success. 
and I preferred the interests of my friends before those of all the islanders in the South Seas. This is a poor private morality, if you like, but it is mine, and the best I have, and I am not half so much ashamed of having embarked at all on this adventure, as I am proud that, while I was in it and for the sake of my friend, I was up early and down late, set my own hand to everything, took dangers as they came, and for once in my life played the man throughout. At the same time I could have desired another field of energy, and I was the more grateful for the redeeming element of mystery. Without that, though I might have gone ahead and done as well, it would scarce have been with ardor, and what inspired me that night with an impatient greed of the sea, the island, and the wreck, was the hope that I might stumble there upon the answer to a hundred questions and learn why Captain Trent fanned his red face in the exchange and why Mr. Dixon fled from the telephone in the Mission Street lodging house. End of chapter 10 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah